So what Zach uh, gave you is an overview of uh, how um, you know, data scarcity can be tackled and how active learning you know, is emerging as a potentially practical and useful technique uh, uh, for settings where we don't have lots of data. Right, so today what I want to talk is the other uh, side of the puzzle, which is to think of generalization, right? So far, like uh, what Zach uh, presented is uh, more with the view of as you're training, can you look at the uncertainty of the samples and based on that, choose the good ones and keep moving on and hopefully train with less data, right? But there is nothing immediately emerging that tells you that it should generalize well. And in fact, uh, you know, most of the works where there are negative results about active learning has to do with the fact that it could overfit on the training and then you have uh, you know, bad uh, result on the test data. And, and indeed, even in practice, right, even when we have ImageNet or very large uh, uh, samples of images, speech, or other uh, data, uh, we still need to regularize. You know, we call this data augmentation. Uh, you know, in practice, you do techniques like if it's an image, you crop, you try to like kind of uh, add noise in places, I mean, either additive noise or you try to mask certain places. Uh, or in speech, there is even like uh, spectral transform and things you do after adding noise. Right, so this domain specific and, and people really need to do it. Without this, even if you have lots of data, you're not able to get good generalization. And the intuition is uh, maybe you're not capturing all the variation of, uh, in the, you know, of what an image should look like in the training data, right? Like the fact that what's a cat may, be, may have so many variations that maybe the simple regularization could help better capture that. Uh, but the question is, can we go beyond that? Can we uh, have more sophisticated techniques that will help us generalize better? And uh, what are those? So kind of the viewpoint here is, uh, you know, there is the prediction task, but uh, we probably shouldn't consider it in isolation, right? So Zach also alluded to that, that, uh, you know, when you have the prediction, you're like going from X, the input to the label Y, but you also need to think about how the image was generated, like how from the category, what the image looks like, the distribution of X given Y, right? So you wanna look at both these distributions uh, in combination, and that can, you know, potentially lead to better generalization. Because if you're only looking at the conditional predictive distribution, right, so you're losing information about the variations of generating the image because the opposite that is X given Y, what it's telling you is given that it's a cat, what is the distribution of all cats, right? So if you had this distribution, then you will uh, you know, understand all the variations of the cat. And so you can hope to generalize better. But of course we can ask for that, but we usually don't get this, right? But why is that? Because, I mean, generative model is uh, typically much more challenging than uh, learning a predictive modeling. So all these gains that we have in deep learning have been mostly on the prediction side and very little on the generation side relatively. Right, so, so that's because, you know, when you do the prediction, you're, uh, <laughs> You know, ready, you know, you have this information bottleneck, you're going from this large domain of images to maybe a few thousand categories, right? So you can like kind of ask what is the relevant image to categorize this image and uh, uh, be efficient about that. But on the other hand, for generation, it's the opposite. You're going from a few thousand categories to looking at all the possible domain of images and uh, that's hard. And, and indeed, I mean, you're going from X to Y, you have an information loss, so you can't just immediately invert it and get the model from uh, Y to X, right? So, so that's why this is challenging to design uh, generative models. I know there's been a lot of uh, work in the space, and I'll, I'll give some uh, intuitions of what could uh, work well uh, for images and also beyond, right? If we go beyond images to other domains, what would it be? Yeah. So I think everybody here is aware of uh, gener 
uh, generative adversarial networks or GANs, uh, the idea is because we don't know how to generate uh, images directly, uh, can we instead have this discriminator uh, that gives feedback on which image is fake or not? Right, so by this feedback, you hope to generate uh, more realistic images, and indeed, this is the state of art in image generation. You know, it can give you very realistic looking images. But on the other hand, can this help in generalization? Right, so remember, our goal is to augment our data set through generative models, and then in the hope, uh, train better predictive models that can generate, that can, uh, you know, predict. Uh, maybe even outside of the training set distribution and uh, do uh, prediction in the wild. And so for that, you know, we are less worried about whether it generates realistic Im looking images, but more whether it can help in data augmentation. And there, uh, you know, so far nobody has managed to do it with natural images in a rich enough domain. And the reason is because along with generating some realistic images, it also generates a lot of artifacts. Right, so if you have the distribution of faces, they have, there is a, a large proportion of what uh, GAN generates that does not look anything like a face. And so you cannot just automatically pipeline it. You can't just have a GAN and feed all those images to a classifier and uh, hope for it to do well. So, so if you cannot do that just with GANs, can we use other uh, you know, existing uh, uh, frameworks for generating images. You know, so the fields of graphics has uh, spent decades on uh, designing good renderers, you know, good uh, animation uh, frameworks that can uh, generate realistic looking uh, images, right, images and videos. So can we utilize this? And, uh, you know, so this is, this is great for uh, visual, uh, maybe very realistic looking ones, but uh, the distribution can be quite different from the natural images. Uh, that's because to make it look realistic to the eye, there can be quite a bit of biases introduced uh, in the process of rendering. And so in one of the works, what we wanted to ask was, can we combine both of them? Because you know, the GAN frameworks tries to match distributions uh, but so far, you know, it's not able to completely do this well and is introducing artifacts. On the other hand, if we start with a graphics renderer, uh, you know, we have a fairly uh, realistic looking image. Can we then hope to correct it? Like, you know, hope to push this distribution of synthetic images closer to the distribution of real ones and then through this uh, get uh, better training data, right? So. You know, so the, what, this is what we call uh, Mr. GAN or Mixed Reality GANs. Uh, that's, you know, Tan came up uh, with the title. Tan uh, uh, interned uh, with me at Amazon AI with me, Zach, and Stefano, um, and uh, is a student at Rice. So what we proposed was uh, this framework of, using this framework of cycle GAN, uh, where the idea is it's now transforming from one domain to the other, right? So in a cycle GAN, what you have is you have two domains, X and Y, and I guess this doesn't work. Uh, so what you do is you simultaneously learn the transformations from, both the, from one domain to the other and vice versa, right? So and there are these cycle consistency losses where you enforce that you know, when you go through the cycle, it should, you, get, you should get back the original domain, and you do that for both the domains. And, uh, you know, people have shown that the cycle GAN is um, more effective because it's trying to learn transformations on both the sides, right? So it's learning both these transformations uh, simultaneously, and so this uh, can enforce a cycle consistency, and uh, that's more effective in trying to learn both the transformations G and F um, in an effective way. So what we proposed was a simple extension of this where we said, uh, why just do it once? You can do the same multiple times, right? So the idea is in the first step, you learn a cycle GAN, you transform both you know, you know, synthetic to real and real to synthetic, and then in the next step, you apply the same thing again. 
right? So, so why can this be more effective? So the intuition is maybe the synthetic and real domains are quite far away. So if you try to learn cycle GAN in one step, maybe you can't get them to be very close to one another. But the hope is if you do that again and again, you will get closer, right? So this is stage one. So when you try to get the real and synthetic closer to one another, maybe they only get this close. But then if you do that again progressively, you hope to you know, get better. Right, so that's the intuition of uh, you know, doing it progressive may help you. Uh, progressive in terms of the number of stages you try to transform uh, may ha help you get the two um, uh, distributional domains closer to one another, or rather those uh, matching the two distributions. And so um, we did experiments on um, four classes from C400 uh, and taking uh, these uh, 3D models from ShapeNet. Uh, so the main challenge here is to also get like, um, you know, realistic enough renderers because many of them are also closed off uh, and not uh, proprietary, right? So the open ones we uh, used was the NVIDIA Falcor. And so you can get lots of uh, uh, synthetic images, right? So that's the beauty of it. You have the 3D models. You can, you know, now control different angles, different uh, poses, sh lighting, all kinds of um, variations you can do with your uh, renderers. And so this way you can get uh, very good variations that you may not get if you just took data from the web. You know, there's a lot of bias in how if you collect the data set from the web, you only get certain kinds of images. But uh, with uh, you know, this kind of a synthetic renderer, you have a lot more control, right? So you control what kind of variations you want in your data. So that was the strength of it. We could like kind of now sample a whole set of variations. And then we used very little uh, real data, just like about 2,500 uh, samples of uh, real um, images. And we wanted to ask uh, what the uh, result is. Uh, so the idea is if you just use synthetic without real, even that small amount of real data, the performance is quite poor, right? So the testing is on real data. And so you can see there is quite a bit of uh, domain mismatch. So uh, just doing uh, synthetic uh, uh, did not help. I mean, in fact, it's this, right? So without any GAN technique, if you just do synthetic, it's just 57%. And uh, uh, if you you know, then refined it, you can see that it is improving. So the cycle GAN is one stage, so you only do uh, like one uh, step transformation. So it improves from 57 to 61. And if you do a second step, then you also get further boost. So if you add with real data, the uh, boost is quite significant. Even though that's a very small amount of real data, we see that uh, uh, you know, it can, um, so even real data just with, because it's only four classes in this kind of toy setting, you get pretty good result with just even 2,500 examples. But then adding uh, the synthetic one gives quite a big boost. It goes all the way up to 93% uh, uh, using this technique. So the idea is, you know, I've think like using all the synthetic data has a lot of potential to train um, good classifiers, but also robust ones, right? So if you uh, can capture all the variations you expect uh, while testing it, especially in the wild, you can control the training process much better. And so these are, to me, still preliminary experiments that show that it's possible to combine uh, synthetic data with GANs uh, and the domain um, adaptation will help you um, get the synthetic data to be much closer to the real one and hence help in uh, predict, uh, improving generalization. So that's what we showed um, in this work. So some like kind of more visualizations of uh, how, uh, you know, so this was the synthetic and this is the real data and you can see that synthetic is uh, you know, kind of both are modified, right? So for sure, the real, if he is getting more, less real, uh, you know, after the process of sending it through the GAN. 
and you can see more examples of this. Uh, so these are synthetic uh, examples. For instance, here you can see this example here, the background got a little more realistic uh, than what it was. I mean, it's hard to say by visual kind of just looking whether which one is realistic or not. So our, our goal is to measure uh, predictive performance and not the visual appeal, right? So I wouldn't go too much by just looking at the what it does visually, but at least there is sometimes you can see like kind of the backgrounds changing uh, in many examples. And same from the real to, uh, you know, getting it closer to synthetic in some sense. So you can, uh, you know, so this is the reverse transform. So you have both. Um, and so that was the idea behind uh, this work that we try to ask, can we, you know, both move the real and synthetic domains closer to one another and in the process help us leverage synthetic data better for uh, training uh, powerful classifiers. Yeah, so, I mean, we use the NVIDIA Falcor, the open uh, source uh, renderer, you know, we generated a whole bunch of uh, backgrounds and then the ShapeNet 3D models. Uh, and if we have better ones, I feel like, you know, it can help you a lot, <laughs> like more powerful proprietary renderers uh, could do a much, be much better job than what these open source ones are doing. I mean, so, you know, that it, that's very hard, right? So that's the next part, like, of generative models. Can we, you know, use other techniques to do that? I mean, in graphics, we have this. So this is coming for free, then can we adapt it? Because if, gen, you know, like, if, yes, if we don't have it, then we have to think of other ways to uh, generate our data, right? Design generative models. But for, you know, images and videos, we have a lot of, already built in knowledge, can we uh, leverage that was the point of that work, yeah. So now, if, uh, you know, precisely leading to the next part, right? What if we don't have uh, such uh, rendering models? Uh, can we use other techniques to try to um, design the generative models? Uh, so as we said, you know, we have done very well in, with deep learning on predictive tasks, but uh, less so with generative ones. Uh, so the one question we asked was, can we have a common model for both, you know, prediction and generation, right? So essentially, if you have the full joint distribution, P of X comma Y, you can do both. Um, I mean, there's nothing kind of uh, fantastic here so far, but the thing is we already know what are good predictive models. You know, for images, we know it's convolutional neural networks. And so can we try to reverse engineer and find a generative model such that when you do the reverse, when you do inference in the generative model, you will end up with this uh, convolutional neural network as your uh, inference process, right? So can we try to reverse engineer? I mean, we know it's not reversible by itself. Can we try to design priors such that uh, when you reverse the process of generation, you will end up with a convolutional neural network. And so this framework, we call this uh, latent uh, dependent uh, deep rendering model. I'll, in a minute, I'll sh say why, um, you know, where the name is coming from. Uh, you know, there is a rendering model and it's deep, it's multiple layers because, you know, the convolutional network is also deep. And then there are latent variables that, uh, gen you know, capture the variations in this process. And this is joint work uh, with, again, Tan. You know, we continue talking after the internship and that's when he was, he, um, you know, got into this uh, work along with Nat, uh, uh, Ankit, uh, Michael Jordan, and Rich Baranyak. So what is the intuition here? So the intuition is, uh, you know, we want to go from the, uh, the object category to the image. And so we don't do it directly, right? So there is a whole set of intermediate uh, rendered images. 
So think of it as coarse to fine grained, right? So you don't directly render your image um, in the finest scale, you go through these intermediate steps. And all through this, you have a whole bunch of latent variables uh, that are like priors, right? So they capture different variations of how you render from one step to the other. Uh, I mean, you can write down this model and you know it's intuitive, but the whole question is what are the details, right? So how do you design this prior over uh, latent variables? What should these operations of intermediate rendering look like? Right, I mean, that's why this is so hard. We don't know how to generate uh, images just from the category, right? So, so how do we do this? And so as I said, the, uh, for us, the intuition came from trying to reverse engineer the convolutional network, right? Because now if I want to reverse these directions, I want to do inference in the model, I should have these steps to be the steps of a convolutional neural network. So meaning convolution operations, spatial pooling, then maybe fully connected layer here and so on, right? So can you recover that architecture when you reverse this process of rendering? And again, these latent variables could have a meaning in terms of you know, what um, you know, information is lost going from going backwards, right? Going from the image and going through those steps. So they can try to capture that uh, loss of information going from image uh, to the object category. And uh, so, no, so first, like, what are some intuitions, right? So what, as I mentioned, like, uh, in the image, what you do is you do convolution, you then do spatial pooling, then you do this fully connected layer, you know, you do nonlinearity, and then fully connected layer, you get the category. So now you try to reverse the same, you have these intermediate rendering, which, you know, which is the opposite, right? It's going from a smaller spatial dimension to a larger spatial dimension. And so again, you have like filters in each of the steps. So the filters, you try to uh, get um, you know, them to be the transpose of the filters in the other direction. Right, so, so you can like try to design such that you attempt to reverse it. I mean, this is not a reversible process, but you attempt to do that uh, you know, with the intuition now that the rendering is going from a coarse resolution to the finer one. Um, so that's the basic intuition, but some more details of um, what this uh, now latent variable does, right? Because what I mentioned was the latent variable is trying to capture how information is lost as you go from one convolutional layer to the next uh, in a uh, convolutional network uh, through spatial pooling because you're reducing the dimension, you're like not copying everything from your layer below to the layer above, right? So that's what happens um, in the uh, convolutional network, uh, you do convolution and this max pooling and ReLU and everything loses information when you uh, go up a level. And so here, what you do is the latent variable does tr tries to reverse that. What it does is it copies the activation here uh, to activation below. And so there is a, but it doesn't do it deterministically, right? So there's a random variable, a Bernoulli variable that says how it should, uh, should it copy or not? And that's this is render variable. And then there is like a zero padding because you have this dimension increasing when you go a layer below. So you have this larger dimension. So you have to decide where to translate it. Like where should I move uh, if I'm copying this? So that's again a very, you know, uh, that has randomness, right? So you're not deterministically doing it. Uh, you have uh, stochasticity on how you should translate uh, when you decide to copy. And so that's in intuitively the uh, reversing of uh, uh, convolution. So you have now latent variables to capture the variations going from a coarse, uh, coarse resolution to a finer res resolution. And kind of that's the, and then because the convolution is summing up the two, you have the same thing. You do that at each location, you sum them all up, and that's how you get the layer below, right? So, I mean, uh, the details are in the paper, but you can try to all now reverse engineer the convolutional neural network and uh, design a prior on all the latent variables such that 
uh, in the limit, like when you send the noise that you add, the Gaussian noise at the end you add to zero, what happens is, uh, you know, like likelihood maximization in this generative model uh, for prediction is the same as cross entropy training in the convolutional neural network. So meaning you do recover your convolutional neural network if you do prediction using this generative framework. And there's also some very nice uh, uh, theoretical bounds we can derive on what intuition it gives us on generalization. Right, so I mean, there's always been this intuition that uh, uh, you know, if you understand the generation process, you can say much better about generalization, right? Because you know all the variations. But this is much more concrete. It's saying if you have an architecture for generation, so this is going from category to images, uh, if you have it such that the number of actively rendered paths is small, right? So the actively rendered path is where you decide to copy from one step to the next. So if you look at all those paths, if the number of such paths is minimized, you are better off in generalization. You have a more generalizable network. So what it's doing is it's using information of the generative process to talk about generalization, right? So there is this nicely bringing the two together. I don't think generalization for prediction should be seen in isolation of uh, uh, the uh, generative process. And here it's bringing the two together. But, uh, but anyway, the nice thing is it's actually also practical because we can uh, design a new uh, regularization, what we call rendering path normalization to train these models more effectively. And this gives quite a big boost uh, in our uh, uh, predictive performance, uh, as we'll see uh, shortly. Yeah, so some uh, semi-supervised learning results. So the idea is once you have both the generative model and this uh, predictive model together, you just, you know, you can use the likelihood and train on both labeled and unlabeled samples together. So semi-supervised learning is uh, direct here. And what we see with our preliminary results is, uh, you know, when you have sufficient number of labels, you do get uh, the state of the art. And the other ones which got the state of the art if with less number of labels are actually complementary techniques. So that try to have a teacher and a student and do consistency regularization. So we can do the same with ours. I mean, so far we didn't just to you know, compare, uh, but you can also add these other techniques and hopefully it will uh, give uh, results across the board. Yeah, but the main uh, message is that uh, you can, uh, uh, you know, think about designing generative models based on successful prediction uh, architectures, right? So can you try to reverse engineer that? And with those intuitions, we may get towards much more effective uh, generative models as well. So the last one I want to quickly say is what about other domains? So far, a lot of it is in images. You know, that's where we have renders. That's where we have very good predictive models. Uh, so this was uh, kind of an abstract uh, question we asked, but made it, you know, our uh, setup was uh, the set of uh, mathematical functions, right? So think of like uh, trigonometric functions like sine, cosine, maybe log, some algebraic functions we want to, uh, learn all at the same time. So you're not learning one function, you're learning an entire domain of functions. And why is this effective? Because if you try to learn just one function with a neural network, it, you can't hope for it to generalize outside of the training domain, right? So if you only give a uh, sign, you know, within this domain, you have no idea what happens outside. But suppose you now give a whole bunch of uh, uh, functions together, and you also know the basic axioms or relationships between them. Can we use that to train a much uh, better, uh, uh, not only a fit of the function, but hope that it generalizes and also do symbolic tasks like equation completion and verification. So you're not only learning a functional fit, you're also learning the symbolic relationships all simultaneously. So how do we do both of them together? I mean, symbols and I know continuous representations, usually they, it's hard to reconcile, right? There's always this debate of which to want to do. But we found a way to do both. And the idea, the answer is trees for both of them, 
right? So it's clear that if you have an equation, uh, I mean, here we only looked at uh, equalities, although you can extend that to inequalities. So you can do that uh, with a tree, right? You can say like, you know, there is the theta is the symbolic variable here. I'm sending it through the sine function, then I'm squaring it, adding it. And so you do all these operations, you can express that as a tree. Similarly, when you evaluate a function, you can do that also as a tree, but the key is representing numbers, right? So how uh, representing numbers is also through the decimal tree system, because I'm only using numbers from zero to 10, and everything else I'm uh, you know, forming as a part of this, right? So I'm giving the information of how numbers are formed. So even if you have a number outside the domain, you have better hope of reasoning about it because you're learning from scratch all the relationships, right? So it's like, how do humans learn to count? And then you know, they did multiplication and all these more complex operations. But can we all learn those relationships in this domain and then with that have a, uh, much better hope of generalizing beyond just the training data. And so the natural framework was to use tree LSTM. So you can learn now embeddings, uh, you know, through LSTM cells for each of uh, the functions, right? Whether it's sine or cosine. Uh, and we had like one hot encoding for symbols and just the numbers from zero to 10, but everything else you can derive uh, like embeddings for multiplication, addition, everything you can derive, right? And so because now you have continuous representations, you can now ask all kinds of questions. You can ask whether an equation is true or not. And if you want a complete equation or evaluate function, you can look for closeness uh, in the vector space. So you can do all the operations of both symbolic operations such as equation verification and completion, as well as this numerical evaluation all in the same one, right? So it's multitask, multi-function learning uh, by looking at this common framework of tree representations uh, to model all the operations. So, you know, so we get pretty good uh, function evaluation. Uh, it's not surprising, uh, but also like completion, right? The idea is there's not one answer, there are multiple correct answers, and you can see all of them have high probability. And same, you can also evaluate functions, and so you can do all these different tasks with pretty good error. So those are some of the details. Uh, you know, I want, you can see that in the paper that appeared at Eichler, uh, but so what I want to kind of uh, point out here is you could ask, okay, I could just do function fitting on its own and then I can do it with all this extra information, right? So of course, if you just uh, try to do function fitting in isolation, you get it's very error prone compared to what uh, you can get this as a whole. That's not very surprising. But what's more surprising is for the symbolic task. You could say, let me forget about the number system. I, I'll just have a set of these uh, symbolic equations. I will just uh, train three LSTM on that without worrying about what it evaluates to, right? Without having any numbers uh, in my formulation. So if you try to do that, uh, you get a worse performance compared to when you also have uh, numerical data, even on symbolic tasks. Right, so the idea is like kind of having this representation for numbers and providing uh, evaluations of functions uh, in the numerical form helps also symbolic tasks because it gives more evidence. So it's giving more uh, idea of relationships. So, so you know, this kind of points that you know you shouldn't look at symbol symbolic evaluations as separate from numerical ones, right? You should try to do them together, and that'll give better performance on a whole range of tasks together. And so, the kind of that's the hope of for generalization that you don't look at one task or one function, but an entire domain. And in this case, we indeed could uh, generate lots of synthetic data, right? Because once you have basic axioms, you can generate expressions of different depth, you can evaluate functions, uh, but it'll be interesting to do in domains where maybe there's some limited amounts, but that ill-posedness is sort of resolved by uh, really using the uh, you know, relationships and uh, equalities and inequalities uh, to get at a better solution. Yeah, so I think I'm already out of time. So as a quick conclusion, uh, 
today, uh, Zach and I, uh, you know, try to address the problem of overcoming large data requirements in deep learning. Right, so we you know, thought of how, uh, you know, during the collection process, if you used active learning, uh, can you significantly improve your data requirements? And the answer is um, mostly positive to me, right? So even extensive evaluation, we see that uh, uh, you're much better off doing um, active learning with techniques like uh, Bayesian-based uh, disagreement uh, across a whole range of tasks. And the other aspect was you don't just actively uh, you know, say which data should be labeled, but also what question to ask. So can you actively ask, decide what question to ask? I mean, that's how humans interact. But also during the training of the model, you don't uh, wait to get the full uh, you know, fine-grained information on each label, but you keep moving on actively and get only partial information. And that will save you a lot of time and money and still get you towards a very good model. And same with the aggregation stage. The idea is not to focus on getting each training example very error-free, but to try to get as many, and even though they're noisy, you can have label noise correction techniques in, built into your model that can overcome that. And so kind of that's the basic overall take from this. Like, uh, you know, you can afford to be uh, noisy during the data collection and aggregation process, uh, but you can save a lot of time and money by doing so and still get good models, right? So, so much of uh, collect data collection is separate from the training. So you, you know, and that's why there's a lot of kind of pipelines there to try to correct for errors, but if you put them two together, you're much better off. And then in the last stage, I focused on the data augmentation techniques, focusing more on generalization, like what are ways to uh, capture the variations in the data so that we can be much more effective on the test data, especially if you're testing in the wild and uh, outside uh, our training um, distribution. And so, you know, we said when uh, images we have graphics renderers, can we use that as a good starting point and then do GAN on top of that uh, to tr try to correct for domain shift? And we see that it has the potential to improve performance. Uh, then we saw like models that jointly are both generative and predictive. So you're trying to design priors in the generative model that, so that when you do prediction, you get um, some of the state-of-the-art deep learning architectures, and that gives us to the state-of-the-art semi-supervised learning results. And then in the last, we said, you know, why limited learning for only one function? Um, you know, if you can learn a whole domain of functions and build in all the relationships between them, you can be much better off for generalization. Thank you.